Hi, my name is Dave Franzen. I'm an Extension Soil Specialist at North Dakota State University, and I was asked to address some of the work that I've been doing uh, recently on ammonia fixation in soils and nitrogen rate. So if you open a textbook or read something about the nitrogen cycle, this is basically what you're going to get. The, the uh, red, like here, indicates the losses from the system. From the soil and blue is the inputs to the soil or the crop and then green are these processes down here so so we have commercial fertilizers being applied or annual manures and, or plant residues uh, being applied there's biological fixation by legumes uh, there's a little bit of atmospheric fixation when the lightnings and deposition and, and then we lose it through runoff and erosion uh, in these processes here ammonium is changed to nitrate by nitrification and then in waterlogged conditions other bacteria can convert it to nitrous oxides and nitrogen gas n2 gas and it can be lost from the system uh, it can be tied up by organic matter that's called immobilization it can be released from the residues called mineralization so you have organic nitrogen being converted to ammonium and then nitrate so that's what the textbooks basically show but but my talk is going to be about what's missing so to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, I want to review the clay chemistry. I think you're a little bit more aware of clay chemistry than you were a few years ago because North Dakota has clay chemistry in their potassium recommendations. And also Dan Kaiser is now working to investigate clay chemistry across North, uh, Minnesota. And Jason Clark is working on it in South Dakota to try to see if they can revise their potassium recommendation, see how important that is. So the basic building blocks are a silicon, silicon tetrahedral sheet and an aluminum octahedral sheet. And this is what the silicon tetrahedral sheet looks like. So um, the central atom is a silicon and it has a plus four charge and so there's four oxygens coordinated around it that it's like a three-sided pyramid so that's the basic building block and they don't and they're and they're not they don't exist isolated they exist in sheets these clay minerals were made during the crystallization of aluminum and silicon materials in lava and magma when it reaches the surface and cools it crystallizes and forms these sheets because it has to it just physical chemistry it has to do that so that's a silicon tetrahedral sheet aluminum octahedral sheet is the central atom is aluminum and then coordinated around it are oh groups and it forms uh, structures so that there's eight sides that's what the octahedra means uh, the oh the, the oxygen points toward the aluminum and the hydrogen are stuck out here so it tends to have more of a positive charge it's a par 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 partial positive charge not a full positive charge and so that allows for the attraction of the silicon oxide sheet which has a partial negative charge out here and possible partial positive charge here and they coordinate up very very well and so they tend to be attracted to each other so the clays i'm going to be talking about are two to one clays um, not the illites um, and i'll show you a representation of that in a minute but mostly the smectite clays the shrinking swelling things so all these two to one clays whether they're illites or smectites they have a two to one which means that the top and bottom layer are silicon oxide sheets and then this um, the interior the one is the aluminum hydroxide sheets so that's a two to one mineral one two and then one in the middle so they're they tend to be stacked um, some a, a lot more than others uh, but uh, this is a representation of a smectite uh, t for tetrahedral and the and the o for octahedral so you have a two to one two to one two to one so 
when the when the gap in between the clay layers, this this clay layer and this clay layer, is uh, reduced, that's uh, that's characteristic of a clay we have in Minnesota and North Dakota called bidolite. Uh, and it's called a high charge clay. And then low charge clays tend to have a higher, uh, a larger gap in between. And those are Montmorillonites. But all of these allow the movement of cations and their water shells uh, in and out depending on how moist the soil is. The illites, on the other hand, are, are less weathered clays and they still have the potassium binding in between. So there's very little shrinking and swelling in an illite because the potassium binds these two together. Remember the tetrahedral sheet has par partial negative charges because of the oxygen and the silicon oxides uh, on the top and bottom and so potassium is tightly held here. And that stems from the mineral mica, where all of these uh, originate from. And, and mica is very, very tightly held, of course, and, and not very weathered at all. All right, so let's let's look at these again. So, so here's here's a bilite, high charge. There's a illite, and it's pretty much bound together. And here's a montmorillonite that it's uh, kind of ions are swimming around in between the clay layers if it's pretty moist. All right, so if that doesn't make any sense to you, maybe this will make a little bit more sense. So the clay on the left-hand side on those micrographs is kaolinite, and you can see the individual or pretty close to individual sheets of kaolinite stacked one on top of the other. These are one-to-one -one clays, one layer of silicon oxide, one layer of of aluminum uh, hydroxide, and they're just stacked, um, and they're very tightly stacked too. When we get to the illites, uh, you can see the individual layers, but they're not nearly as tightly stacked. They have a little bit of a gap in here. They have some crocking and things. Uh, but when we get to the smectites, uh, high shrink and swells, um, probably a Montmorillonite or something like it, uh, these are pretty wavy. There's gaps in between. Uh, there's all kinds of movement that can happen in between there, and they don't have that stacked feature that these do here. So the important thing about uh, potassium clay chemistry is, is that when smectites dry, they collapse and they trap the potassium inside of it. And when it's moist, this doesn't happen. There's plenty of water and the clays expand. Uh, it also happens when the soil freezes. Of course, when water freezes, it expands. That's why ice doesn't sink in a lake. And so uh, and then when it thaws, it collapses a little bit. But the, the greatest the greatest forces at work are during the wetting and drying. And when it dries, the clays collapse. They fix the they trap the potassium inside the, those clay layers, and we call it fixation, which I hate the term. It's more like temporarily retaining uh, because it's a reversible process. So here's a couple of images. This is a six leaf corn. You can see the lower leaves are more affected with the potassium. It tends to be more on the outside of the leaf. And as the severity increases, it, um, it uh, moves in and in on the mid mid vein but the mid vein stays green for a while and this is later on in the season uh, where you have really maybe a really really dry summer and questionable potassium levels in the soil and you really get that deficiency symptom even up in the top leaves so when it collapses the distance between these clay layers uh, decreases greatly and larger cations it's just not potassium in here it's calcium magnesium and you know any other positive charge ion that's around and, and it traps the potassium in between and if you have oxidized iron uh, that also traps the traps the cations in between. So you so you have collapse of the layers and you do not release the potassium. And in fact, during the drying process, you tend to draw more potassium into the sheets. So we, we figured out that uh, clay chemistry was important. The higher the smectite level would be, the, the higher your critical level of potassium in the soil needs to be in order to compensate for for that lack of potassium during dry periods. So I went to every county in the state and took um, 
samples from several soils, uh, major soil groups, and had the lab run smectide, li, kaolinite, chloride, which is what I haven't talked about. Uh, it's a minor component, but it's it's important potassium and not really in what I'm talking about today. So smectite versus other. So the darker this is, the more smectitic the soil is. So southeastern North Dakota tends to be highly smectitic. Uh, four to five times the amount of smectite as there is anything else, usually illite and a little bit of smattering of kaolinite. These darker areas here um, have probably three to four times as much smectite as they do other things. These gray areas, uh, about twice the smectite as other things, but this white area in here, including significant areas West River, have um, smectite to other ratios, um, generally less than one, maybe up to one and a half in this white area, but uh, a lot of times that's uh, less than one. So other things are more important. In fact, when you get West River into some of those really old sediments, uh, the sample south of the Dickinson Airport had over 75% of the clay was kaolinite, which is typical of what you get in South Georgia. So, you know, this this was tropical 70 million years ago. All right, so I haven't talked a thing about ammonia, so what does that have to do with it? So. The, the thing is, is that ammonia is sub subject to the same fixation process of potassium because the ionic radius of potassium is 133 p.m. And that's pretty similar to that of ammonium, which is 143 p.m. And the hydrate, hydrated radius of ammonium is even smaller than that of potassium. So what does p.m. mean? One angstrom is usually the measure that that physicists and chemists use when you're talking about uh, atoms and atom spacing, and that's 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters, which is, hope you appreciate, that's really small. And so uh, the PM scale uh, means that you don't have to use a minus 10 anymore. It's just a shorthand. 100 p PM is, is um, one angstrom. So the ionic radius of, of uh, potassium is 1.33 angstrom, 1.43 angstrom, 2.5, 4.5. And so this is important because a gap in the smectites, bilites, is um, somewhat less than than uh, 10 angstrom. Uh, and, and, it, and it narrows as the soil dries out. Therefore, since potassium is fixed, it's reasonable to expect that ammonium is fixed also. It's been recognized for a long time that there's ammonia fixation, but we seldom think about it as a source of nitrogen crops. But, but I do consider it for part of North Dakota anyway. In the eastern region of North Dakota, I subdivided this Langdon region out because in the data that, that I combined to revised our wheat recommendations 10 years ago. The Langdon area was unique because it took a lot less nitrogen than the rest of eastern North Dakota. So it, it turns out that that area is very shaly. Every time you take a soil sample, you take up bits of shale. Uh, it's relatively sh shallow to the bedrock shale underneath it, and so the, the shale is really mixed up in it. And a study down in at the USDA Northern Plains Research Station, uh, maybe 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, it showed that, that that shale has high amounts of mineralizable ammonia in it. And so the shale, uh, the soil actually, actually acts as a slow release fertilizer because ammonia is being released from that shale. So that ammonia in there is non exchangeable ammonia that's ancient. And so if we can get ancient non-exchangeable ammonia to release, uh, why can't we get uh, something that's more modern? So we go to cover crops. So the idea of the cover crops, one of the ideas is going to trap nitrate. And if the CN ratio is less than 20, then it's, some of that is going to be released to the next year. So uh, I went into this project innocently and and after the first year, what we found is that here's the yield of cover crop. The year after the cover crop, and we had, I don't know, 5,000 pounds of, of dry matter and about 140 pounds of, of cover crop in, and figured that this curve should be above that one. But it was the other way around. There wasn't any release from the cover crop at all. That 
the difference here in the zero N rate and over here is about 100 pounds of N. So uh, it didn't release any nitrogen at all and it took, um, took more N to make that crop. So that was uh, weird and uh, surprising. So we went to the next year, started thinking about what could be happening, where does it go? Because we don't see it in the soil test, we know it's there, hasn't evaporated, uh, the year was relatively dry, and so we wouldn't expect denitrification or, nit uh, or nitrate leaching. So the next year, in a different field, same cooperator, the nitrogen in the cover crop had about 85 pounds of N per acre from about 3,000 pounds of biomass. And again, we have a lag here, not as much as the year before, but approaching about 50 pounds difference between the yield here and the yield here. Uh, so we're still lacking. We're not releasing much nitrogen at all. So one of the things I did this year that I didn't do the year before was that uh, on soil samples we took at the, on the fall of the year, we we had non-exchangeable ammonia run on those, which is not a standard test, and, and it's, a, it's a fussy test, and, and it's an expensive test. And the difference between the non-exchangeable ammonia we found after the cover crop soil, two, two years of cover crop, one after the wheat, and one interseeded in the, in the corn, was 480 pounds, and where we had no cover crop, we killed it out really early, 328. So the difference, was 152. So that's where the nitrogen appears to be going. And the N rate we used didn't have any any effect on, on the non-exchangeable ammonia, whether it was in cover crop or no cover crop. And the cover crop had, was the only effect, and summers were dry. We've had a summer that was wet, and, and we didn't see any difference there. But in summers that are dry, we do. So is the nitrogen eventually released? Uh, I think so. We probably experience it as stealth N that would appear in the soil test over time. So what I think has happened is that fixation occurs in the dry summer at the root and the clay interface. So here's a series of, of micro micrographs. These are really, really small. The uh, distance here between here and here is is, is one millionth of a, of a meter, one micrometer. And so here in, on one, we have, we show root exudates and biofilms. We have fine roots showing right here. Um, and then we have clay mineral grains here. You can kind of see a little bit in the filaments of the clay minerals uh, in, in four and five. We have aggregates of, of minerals, and uh, in five, in six and seven, we have inorganic filaments here, and then here is a fine clay aggregate. This is very typical of a smectite that will happen in the soil. We have these um, these bundles of, of sheets, and so we're looking at um, at clay individual clay minerals here in association with roots and clay and other clay aggregates, and so here uh, we have. Um, uh, pollen grain, and here we have a fine root coming in, and here we have uh, aggregates with a lot of root remnants, it says, and then we have primary minerals. Here's another smectite band, uh, clay mineral coating. So all this is happening at the nano scale. So I think this is where the fixation's happening. It's dry, it's not moving around, it's right next to the clays, it's just being sucked in. So I, uh, I hope you found this um, intriguing and we're pursuing this uh, research uh, this next year. Uh, the samples we took this last year haven't been analyzed yet. Again, it's a kind of a tough, tough analysis. So if you have any comments or anything, I'll be, I'll be talking about this a little bit later uh, today in a panel. Um, and you can also Get a hold of me through my email address or, or text or phone call. So thank you.